couple of weeks ago, I got a phone call, and um, this gentleman on the phone said, I'd like to come and preach at your congregation. And so we met with him, and we asked him to come and talk to us today. And I'll give you a little bit of background. He's a local boy, grew up in Fall Creek, went to Lowell High School, graduated from there, went to Lane Community College, then to Northwest Christian College. And one of the professors he had at Northwest Christian College was a man named Garth Blake. <laughs> um, you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then he went to Fuller Seminary. Um, and today he's with us. And uh, so please welcome Chad Decay. Sure whether I'm supposed to stand at the pulpit or not, but I'm kind of a mover, so uh, you know, you'll have to forgive me. I tend to want to do more things than years of acting, I guess. Garth, yeah. Garth did? Okay, good. Then, then I'll probably pace around a bit, but I think uh, just to get my bearings to stand here for a second and get myself all set up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I appreciate the introduction. I've, uh, I've enjoyed getting to be with you all this morning. I, uh, I felt like I, I was kind of home in a way, because Fall Creek growing up was a lot like this, very similar, uh, right down to, to the way community was taken. And I've done community in a lot of different ways, a lot of different people over a lot of different times. I'm kind of right that I actually started doing communion earlier in my life than, than now, which is good. Six was when I decided I wanted to be baptized, and nobody could convince me otherwise. <laughs> they tried, they certainly tried. Um, but for me, uh, it's just a lot of what's being done here just feels like home, um, which is, is really nice. I really appreciate getting the opportunity to spend this time with you. Um, as far as preaching goes, you know, it's, it's sometimes better to know the people that you're preaching to, and I, I only know some of you a little bit, so it makes it a little harder. But I've always believed and have grown to believe even more in my life that, that the Bible does everything it needs to do when it comes to reaching our hearts, as long as we open it and, and see what it has to say to us. Because it was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and when we read it together, it illuminates. And the Holy Spirit comes in and, and helps us understand how that matters for us now. How the lives of, of people, you know, three, four thousand years ago, still makes a difference for who we are and what we believe. And I think that's so surprising and wonderful to me. So uh, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of people that, that preach locally at different churches in Harrisburg and La Pine and all sorts of places. They work together to create sermons. So for, for this week um, and, and kind of moving on, I'd like to uh, start us out for Samuel. So if you want to turn there, that'll be where we'll be working. Um, and we'll just be in the first two chapters. Although I'll kind of jump around a little bit and I hope... Uh, Hope you'll uh, be patient with me. So before we begin um, diving into the scripture this morning, if you would uh, bow your heads with me, uh, I would like to cover the, the sermon in a little prayer. I hope the Holy Spirit will, will help us here. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for this time to hear the word uh, read and declared as we think about what it means to follow after you and your son that you gave to us. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit be present with us in this time so that we can just glean from your word what it is that you want us to know. We thank you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I think it's always important when we talk about books of the Bible, we kind of give ourselves a little rundown of where we are. Because uh, 1 Samuel doesn't just happen. It you know, comes because of the people before and it leads us to where we are now, like any little bit of history. And so in 1 Samuel, you're coming right out of what they would call the time of the judges. And if you've ever read the book of Judges, you know it's a pretty violent and crazy time just after Israel gets into the Promised Land. And it's not sure whether they actually conquered anything or whether they kind of just moved in. Like, hey, Canaanites, we're going to live here for a while. And so there's this, this, uh, this line back and forth between the people of Israel and 
all the gathered tribes, seven tribes of Canaan, and then later the Philistines. This weird change, this sort of moving into somebody else's space. And so in the time of the judges, it's, it's really similar to what happens with Moses. In fact, it's like a pattern. So you've got the Israelites, and they're in pain, and they're in suffering, and they're unhappy, and they're enslaved, and God hears them. And when God hears something, he doesn't just, like, listen to them. Hear in the Old Testament is always doing. So I hear you means I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to, I'm going to take what you said, and it's going to, something's going to happen. It's not just words, it's not just listening, it's something that's taking place. So God hears them, and he reaches down with a mighty hand, and he pulls them out of that situation. He sends Moses, and Moses gathers the people, rescues them with God's help, and takes them out of that place to somewhere else. And then Moses has his years in the desert, and then he passes it off to Joshua. And then Joshua passes it off to somebody else. But it's always the same pattern. Trouble, and then there's a savior. Every judge is somebody that God calls out of Israel to help out and fix the situation or be active in the situation. And so you have all these amazing people. You have Joshua, you have Gideon, you have Deborah and Barak. You have all these people who are lifting up the nation of Israel and working in them. Of course, classics are people like Samson. These are not perfect people. They're just the people that God appoints. He brings them out. None of these people have perfect lives or perfect family situations or anything that seems quite right. But they are the people God puts in the position to do good for the people of Israel. So we kind of know this pattern is happening and the very last thing that happens in Judges is actually not fighting against another tribe but the destruction of one of their own tribes. The Benjamites pretty much get destroyed, for lack of a better way to put it. Things have happened in this time, and, and it's very possible that by the time we get to 1 Samuel, there's still some judges alive. Samson could very well still be alive at this time. And we know that Eli is alive. And Eli is the 14th judge from Moses. So you have 14 judges up to this point. So that's quite a few years of time in which Israel has passed from person to person. No kings, just leaders. So we get to 1 Samuel, and Eli is the judge. And Eli is also a priest. He actually comes from a line of priests all the way from, does anybody know where the priestly line starts? Yes. It starts with Aaron, right? So we get the beginning of the priest right along with the beginning of the judges. They're hand in hand. And now it's interesting we see a judge that's also a priest. It's a very interesting mixture. Because not all judges were priests. Some of them were warriors. Some of them were you know, people that work with sheep. It didn't really matter. There were all sorts of different judges. So now we get to 1 Samuel, and I think we ought to outline the characters so we know who these people are. The very beginning of Samuel, like the very beginning of most books, starts with genealogy. So who is this guy and where does he come from? And so Elkanah, the, the man that's first talked about, comes from a little town called uh, Ramathayim. Ramathayim is a little town, kind of in the valley, between where the Philistines live on the coast and Shiloh, which is up in the mountains. So if you look at Israel on a map, you kind of have a few miles from the enemy lines, and there's a place over there called Ebenezer, and that's important later in Samuel. But you have these places along the border with Philistia, and then you have to move east and a little bit north to get to Shiloh, which is where most of the story takes place, because Shiloh is where the tabernacle is. So when Samuel were talking about a time before, they had a temple. They just had this tent that travels around, and God is present in the Ark of the Covenant. In fact, the Old Testament believes that, that God rests on the top. He sits. It's his, it's his throne, his mercy seat. He sits on the top of the temple, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, which sits in the furthest part of a very, very heavy tent, the tabernacle. And so we, we get to um, this part of 1 Samuel, and we've got Elkanah, who comes from a, a line of people, a guy named Zuf, which is just a really funny name. And that all comes out of Ephraim. If you remember the tribes, Ephraim is actually one of the sons of Joseph. So there's Joseph and his 11 brothers, and then Joseph has two sons, and they also become 
tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. So Elkanah is an Ephraimite, and that's an important character we need to know. Now Elkanah has two wives. One of them is named Hannah, and the other one is named Peninnah. And these two women have a pretty poor relationship with each other, which we'll learn more about in a minute. But essentially, these two women are both the wives of Elkanah. And then we get to Eli, who, as I said previously, is the judge and also the leader of Israel as well as the high priest. It seems like he's the high priest of Shiloh, where the tabernacle is. Now, as a judge of Israel, he's in charge. People come to him for what to do next. But as a priest, he's also the one who offers sacrifices to God. So this is a pretty big job that Eli has. And you can learn a lot about Eli if you read through 1 Samuel. But one thing we know about Eli is he's a big guy. I mean, he's a chub. He is not a small man. He is quite large. So large, in fact, that when, when we finally see the end of Eli, it's his own weight that takes him out. So he's a big, big man. And probably not very fast moving, I would imagine. As, as you can guess, he probably didn't get along real quickly. And as he got older, he started to lose his sight. So we know a little bit about this guy. And we know more about his sons. The sons were not nice fellows. In fact, we'll, we'll skip right to that and kind of get an outline of them. Because they're not super important to what I have to say, but I think we might want to look at them. So if we can go to... Uh, this will be 1 Samuel 2, uh, verses 11 through 17. You get a second to look up those. So the names of the sons are Hophni and Phineas. And like their dad, they work at the tabernacle there in Shiloh. And like their dad, they're priests. So they have a big job because the priesthood passes down from Aaron to his sons. So it just keeps going. So Hophni and Phineas. so we start out with talking about Elkanah, which is the wife of the husband of Hannah. So then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli. Did I get the wrong verses? I feel like I did. I think it's the next verse I need. Um, yes, 12. I apologize. Thank you for that. So Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. And these are the guys that work for God at the temple. Complete and utter scoundrels. And if we read on, we see what kinds of scoundrels they were. They, uh, they had duties as priests to the people. That whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servants would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. And while the meat was still being boiled, they would dip it in there. And when they pulled out the fork from the kettle, whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated the Israelites who came to child, which means that God's sacrifices were not important to them. They took what they wanted when they wanted. They didn't follow the, the laws that said that they had to wait until the fat had burned off or until God had taken the sacrifice for himself. They got whatever food they wanted. They were greedy, gluttonous, which maybe the size of Eli makes sense. Maybe it's not just his sons. Maybe Eli was a bit of an eater too. They got all the food that came after the sacrifices. And as we move on, we find out um, a little bit more about them. After they, they seal, they also um, they also take the meat before the fat is burned. And the priest servants would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, give the priest the meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. Which, again, this is a major problem. They, they basically were getting their food before God got his sacrifice. Absolutely no respect for what God has asked of the Israelites from the beginning of their time in the wilderness and in Israel. So as we move on from, from that verse, uh, if, if any of the people that were giving sacrifices objected, said, um, let me burn it first and take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now. If you don't, I'll take it by force. So these guys were pretty bad. They essentially were greedy and they were stealing from God before God even had a chance to have a sacrifice. And we, um, we've got to move on in 2 Samuel. If you uh, turn to uh, we get into a prophecy about Eli's sons and it starts in uh, 2 
verses 22 through 25. We can learn a little bit more beyond just stealing sacrifices. We find out that Eli knows that his sons are scoundrels. He's not like unsure of this. So we find out Eli, who is very old, and he heard about everything his sons were doing to all of Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So they were greedy, they were lustful. Um, and as we move on in 23, uh, he, Eli confronts them. He said, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. And um, going on, he says, it is not a good report that I hear from the people of the Lord spreading the rock. Um, God may med uh, mediate for the offender, but if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? If son Tower did not Listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. For some reason or another, it's bad news for Eli and his sons. But you can see what's happened. We get to the 14th judge of Israel, and, and everything is wrong. He's not, not only is he not doing his job, but he's not stopping his sons from doing a bad job, from harming the relationship between the Israelites and God, and harming the relationship between priests of God. And so things have really gone wrong. And that's when we enter into the story. We've got this bad church thing going on. I'm sure some of you have experienced bad church experiences. I know I've had both good and bad. But just think about this. In, in the world of, of worshiping God, things can go really wrong. And it couldn't get any worse for the people of Israel when they came to worship him. They couldn't even, couldn't even give their sacrifice before it was stolen from them. They, they couldn't, they feared for their daughters that served the temple. They, they're just, everything was wrong. And that's the situation we enter into. So we see on the scene enters Elkanah. And Elkanah, like every good Israelite, comes up to Shiloh once a year. And it, it's Shiloh he brings his two wives, of course. So if we move on to 1 Samuel 1, we can start talking a little bit about what I consider to be the main character of our story, Hannah. So in uh, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 1, verses 3 through 11, we'll get introduced to Hannah. Now year after year, Elkanah went out from his town to worship and sacrifice the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. For Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, who we've learned about, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to her sons and daughters, because she, she had lots of kids. She did exactly what she was supposed to do for Elkanah, which is have children. And to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, and the Lord had closed her womb. Now, it's hard to say how old Hannah was, we don't think she was as old as Sarah. It's not as though she's past her ability to have children. She just is not having them. So she's probably fairly young, maybe maybe around my age, somewhere in her like late 20s, early 30s, perhaps, which is really late for a woman this time to have children. And it makes a big difference to her, we'll see. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's wombs, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And as we learned, her rival is the other wife, Peninnah. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house, the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you down hearted? Don't I mean more to you than sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting in his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And we will pause there for a second. So, I think a lot about the kind of person Hannah was. So Hannah has a sense that what she needs to do in her life is provide her husband with sons. And you know, we read in, in the Old Testament accounts that that's it's a big part of what it meant to serve, was to have children and make a difference. If we look as far back as Genesis 9, 1, we see that as they come out of the ark, God tells them that one of their jobs is to 
to be fruitful, to multiply, to go out into the world and to people it. And this is an urge for everybody that lives in this time. And it's a big urge for Hannah. She does not think that she's living up to God's desire for her life. She's not being what she needs to be in order to be useful to her husband, to her clan, to her world. She's doubting God's desire for her to be something more. She doubts her identity in God. I don't know if any of you ever had that happen, but I know I have. I struggle with a sense of, what do I do with my life? And I struggle with a sense of, am I right about what you want me to do with my life? And you see him just heartbroken. Heartbroken that she cannot live up to what she thinks she ought to be for God's service, for her husband, for her future children, for her, her whole history. We know genealogy is important. This is important to her that she passes on the line of her family and Elkanah's family. And everything that's important to her is wrapped up in that. And she's heartbroken. And not only that, she has to deal with this woman she just cannot stand. It's a woman who's taken all of the authority away from her because she's having children. Lots of them. Daughters and sons. And, and Hannah's just overwhelmed. Has anybody had that happen? Think of this. This is something I've seen in, in churches. Although I didn't say anything because there's nothing you want to mess with more than, than power struggles in churches. They're the worst. But I've seen it. And the weirdest thing is, is that for a lot of ladies that I've heard, it, it was... It was around doing tasks, like stuff in the kitchens or, or, or even, you know, things were revolved around communion. But there was this sort of, I do this, this is mine, and I can lord it over you. And guys do it too. It's not limited, but for sure I know what she must have been going through. The sense that she couldn't contribute, and she was always going to have somebody telling her she couldn't contribute, making it worse by making her life miserable every single day. And this is supposed to be a time of great rejoicing. They're giving their sacrifices, they're having feasts, they're, they're spending time with one another, and she has no joy. Just bitterness and weeping and sadness. And she can't even eat. And then we're going to move on a little bit to her encounter with Eli. Because she's now going to go up and cry out to God. And in verse 9, she goes into the tabernacle, or near it, as far as she can. Because she's a woman. So there's a limit to how far in she can go. How close she can get. When they had finished eating and drinking, oh, I'm sorry, no. did I, did I read that? Okay. When they finished eating and drinking, Hannah stood up. Now the priest, Eli, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. And we know he was a big guy, so... He wasn't going to be standing by the door of the Lord's house. He was a very sedentary gentleman. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She's uh, on her knees. Is that how prayer is done in the Old Testament? You see this in Israel? It's a full body experience. Praying is not sitting, it's kneeling, it's going up and down. Talking out loud. So, she made a vow, saying to the Lord Almighty, you will only look on your servant, your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son and I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. And no razor will ever be used on his head. Um, she's dedicating her son as a Nazarite, which is kind of a weird thing, but it happens particularly in the judges. And we even see it a little bit later in a, a man named John, perhaps, this vow to live a very different life where you don't cut your hair and you don't drink wine you don't participate in a lot of celebration. Samson was technically a Nazarite as well. Um, so let's, um, let's move on a little bit from here and look at this encounter she has. She kept on praying to the Lord. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were not moving, but her voice and her lips were moving when her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk. And said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. 
Not so, my lord, Anna replied. I'm a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked them. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went away and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So this is weird, I think, for us, and it's always hard for me to understand. But I think what's what's amazing about this story is, is that Eli is not very good at his job. Like he's sitting by the door and he doesn't notice the deep anguish of this woman. Because in Israel, you didn't pray silently. You didn't read silently. Nothing was done silently. So she would have looked strange to be so overcome with emotion that she wasn't speaking out loud. Because that's how prayer is done. At least it's how it's always been done in Israel. And so Eli clearly thought there was something wrong with her, but he didn't, he didn't wait to see what that was. He wasn't paying attention, he mistreated her in the worst possible way. Like, and I've seen this happen in churches too, this, this mistreatment of one another in worship, we don't realize we're doing it sometimes, but it happens. And it causes enormous pain. And it, you know, a lot of people will, will walk away from worship situations thinking, I'm never going back to that. And Hannah has clearly got every opportunity to be angry at God, because she was just called a drunk when she was really praying to God, really pouring her heart out to him. And the representative of God has just mistreated her as badly as possible. In fact, she's she's experienced failure from, from multiple men in her life. Her husband can't do anything to stop the mistreatment of one wife or the other. And Eli can't even be kind enough to her to help her. But it's weird, even though Eli failed, you see that he blesses her when she leaves. And I'm not sure whether it's Eli's blessing or just God's favor, but she gets what it is that she really needs. And she has her son. And this is where Samuel comes from. Out of all of this brokenness, out of a broken priesthood, a broken church, a world desperately in need of God but not able to reach him because everybody that's supposed to be there to help is, is a scoundrel. It's a broken system now. Just imagine, I mean, that's, that's our world, isn't it? We don't we live in that place where things don't work right? We know they should work differently. And it's not perfection that brings along Samuel, who becomes this great, amazing man of God. It's, it's a broken system. It's a broken family. It's a broken church. It's a, yeah. it's a messed up thing. Yeah. There's no perfection here. This man is coming out of everything bad. And we see him grow up, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, get into that just a little bit before we close and talk about who Samuel is. Because Hannah, despite all this, is going to be faithful. She's going to be enormously faithful. And when she leaves here, I'll just paraphrase, she goes back, and she has Samuel, and instead of going back the next year, she waits to bring Samuel when he's done being weaned when he's, uh, he's no longer breastfeeding. She's going to take him back to the temple, and she's going to give him to Eli, which she's got to know Eli's not a, not a great role model to leave your son with. I mean, you can see what happened to his sons, right? Not a good guy to choose, right? But she's trusting God with the promise she made to him. She's going to be faithful. So she takes Samuel. She leaves him with Eli. And every time that they go back, for years and years to come, she has this encounter, which if you can um, take us to 1 Samuel 2, verses 18 through 20, you get to see kind of what happens with Samuel. Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a, a boy wearing a linen ephod, which is a rope, and it's a pretty fancy one that priests wear, and it's uh, got thick, thick linen. And each year his mother made him a little rope, a little ephod, and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. It's kind of like, 
kind of like a woman making a little tuxedo for a son every year. Sort of. I mean, it's a very important piece of, of service wear. But she's basically doing this every year. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give your children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And she did. She had many children. More sons, more daughters. She was blessed by the situation, even though, you know, everything that happened to her was, was awful. Somehow God heard her in distress, just like he heard the Israelites in Israel. And every time the judge was called, all you have to do is cry out to the Lord, and he hears and he does. And this graciousness, three sons, two daughters, and Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Coming from a bad situation and creating a good situation, working with God to do something wondrous, that Samuel's whole life, as the 15th judge of Israel, he was a model. You can't get any better. I mean, I'm sure he had his issues, but we don't hear much about them except to say that he also had some pretty lousy songs. If we turn um, just to look a little bit, kind of right between the bad stuff about Phineas and Hophni and their judgment, it's the last thing it says about Samuel, and it's in 2.26, just that one verse. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and bear with the Lord with people. This is the same words used about Jesus in Luke, by the way. And Hannah looks an awful lot like Elizabeth um, or Mary. In fact, she has a song that's very similar. And there's this real similarity between Hannah and Elizabeth and between John and Samuel. Pretty good correlation there. Same kind of language. But you see this Savior is coming out of the people out of a broken situation to make it whole again. And as we read more about Samuel, You'll see that later on, he even goes to the people and he says, Have I ever done anything wrong? Have I ever stolen from you? Have I ever harmed you in any way? And you still want a king, even though I'm a good judge. And that's kind of what I want to leave us with today, is that thought that, that there's a lot of brokenness in our lives, in our world, in people around us, and somehow God calls us out of that. He lifts us out of that broken moment the Holy Spirit ministers to us to help us through hard times and blesses us despite bad decisions, bad situations, uncomfortable things, and, and broken churches, broken worship. We have all these opportunities to do great for God, and still, we still have hiccups and problems, even though we've all these wonderful stories to tell us about how it can go bad. And Samuel is called out of this situation as a young boy, as a infant. Like he's called out before he's even born to serve God in this place. And we're all called to. Each and every one of us is called to serve and love the Lord. We don't always know what that is. I've struggled with that my whole life. I still struggle with it. I've been to seminary and I'm still not sure where that is going to lead me. Who do I serve? How do I serve? Are they going to see my service as valuable? Is God going to bless it? Because that's what I want, too. Just like him, I want to make my gifts and abilities valuable to the people of God, to God himself, to Jesus, the Holy Spirit. And God's calling all of us to those things, too. Now, I don't know if anybody out there is, is seeking Christ, is seeking their life to be blessed like Hannah's was, and wants that in their life, wants the opportunity to see blessings and growth, or even just to have comfort in hard times. But that is the desire of God to give to us every day. And this is the time when we remember that we are all called out by God. So if you need to be called to God for the first time, if you need to be called to God, just to renew that sense of purpose in your life, to seek blessing, to seek comfort. I know that there are men and women in this church, wonderful people who will pray with you, will be with you, but if you have that desire, that calling to, to serve the Lord better, I invite you up to, to have that, to experience that sense of God's love and blessing in your life. Because there's nothing better. 
believe old elders in my church said that to me one day. He said, serve the Lord. Go and learn how to be a minister of God because you'll never regret it. And I've had a lot of things, struggles in my life, but I don't regret stepping forward in that time. And I don't think any of you will either. So if you need prayer or anything, I know that um, your elders are amazing people. They'll step forward and pray with you. But this is the time for you to come forward if you would like and receive those blessings and that comfort. Let's stand. Please.